36-year-old Allie two months ago at a bar in New York City. I'd had two drinks, and that is exactly the number that I need to tell you exactly what's on my mind. <laughs> I kind of just want to email Jack and say, if you want to add a woman to your announcing team, I'll be in town and I'm available. That's what I told my friend Christine as I contemplated ordering that third drink. So why not? Just do it, she said. The Jack in this story is Jack Fleming, the acting president and CEO of the Boston Athletic Association, which puts on the Boston Marathon every year. Christine was telling me to send the email, but I wasn't convinced because who was I to tell him how to do his job? So I knew if I'd ordered the third drink, I would have sent the email right then and there on the spot, but I waited. A few days later, though, that email was still on my mind. So I wrote it, took a few deep breaths, I sent it, and then I waited. I waited for a no, I waited for a who do you think you are, don't tell me how to do my job. And as I was playing out those worst case scenarios, Jack's name in bold in my inbox, eight minutes later, and it was a yes. I got the job, 2022. Boston Marathon finish line announcer. And then there's more. Because a few days after that, I got another email from the Boston Athletic Association. This one said, Allie, an opportunity's come up. We want to know if you're interested. I am. I don't even need to know what it is. I know I'm interested. Let's go. Turns out they needed someone at the finish line right there on the ground, interviewing the winners seconds after they crossed the finish line, live on television for the worldwide broadcast of the race. I had no experience doing this, but the job was mine if I wanted it, which I did. I needed zero drinks to commit to that. I was in. <laughs> yes, sign me up. And that's the story of how I got to spend 10 magical hours at the 2022 Boston Marathon finish line. I am here today to tell you to send the email. You might get ignored, ghosted. We say that now. You might get a no. You might get a who do you think you are telling me how to do my job. You also might get a yes, and then another yes, and then another opportunity, and it all might change your entire life. Now, to bring you to that finish line, I want to tell you about a few of my start lines. There's seven-year-old Allie. She was really fun. She collected rocks and gemstones and would tell you those are very different things. <laughs> she also collected stickers, Barbies, floral overalls from the Limited too. But dance was her world. Everything was about dance. Tap, jazz, ballet. Seven-year-old Allie, she had moves. Sixteen-year-old Allie. Still all about the dance life. Competitive dance was all that I cared about. There was another thing. 16-year-old Allie was in love for the very first time. One night, I went out to the Steeplegate Mall in Concord, New Hampshire. Went to all the usual spots. Bath and Body Works, always a hot spot. American <laughs> Ebel, got to get the tank tops. And the sporting goods store. Not because I even know what they carry in a sporting goods store. Dancer, no ball sports. <laughs> but that's where that love worked. And so that night he said, hey, my break's coming up. Do you want to go for a drive in my Jeep? And 16-year-old Allie knew that was usually code for, do you want to park at the movie theater and make out? And yes, I did. <laughs> but that night, that's not what that meant. That night, it was, do you want to go for a drive in my Jeep and I am going to break up with you? I know, it's super sad. And this is what he said. He looked at me in his dumb Jeep and said, you're just, you're too silly. Too silly. And my heart shattered all over his car, whatever kind it was. I don't even remember now. <laughs> I was heartbroken because I was getting dumped by my first love but I was also heartbroken because I was silly. And I thought that was a good thing. I loved making people happy and making people smile. 
That's where I thrived. But now that was a reason someone was breaking up with me. That was a flaw. So I cried a lot. And I wrote a lot of very dramatic diary entries. And when I got that out of my system, I got really serious. 16-year-old Allie said, I will become the editor-in-chief of the number one dance magazine in the world. I went to college. I majored in journalism and was the captain of the dance team. I was making this path happen. And the summer before my senior year, I sent a lot of emails. I found the email address of everyone that worked at that magazine. I emailed the staff, I emailed the editors, I emailed the salespeople, I emailed the publisher. If there was a custodian on the masthead, I emailed that person. I wanted to be an intern. I asked, and I got the interview, and I got the internship. And then, when I graduated from college, I emailed all those people again. Picture of me with my diploma. I graduated, hire me, I'm available. And they did. Three months later, I got a phone call that they were creating a job for a web editor, and the job was mine. I was serious, and I was doing it. I commuted three hours each way from Hamden, Connecticut to downtown Manhattan, and I loved every second of that commute, if you can believe it, because I had a destination. I went to every meeting, which now is silly. We've collectively agreed we hate meetings now, but no, 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 22-year-old Allie, she was in editorial meetings and sales meetings and event meetings and meetings she had no business being in. But I was so excited because I was there and I was in the room and it paid off because a few months, a few years <laughs> into that job, I was pulled into the corner office and told that the current editor-in-chief was transitioning out and I was next in line. 26-year-old Allie, became the editor-in-chief of the number one teen dance magazine in the world. Yeah, I did it. And I seriously did it. I was having fun, but I was serious. I went out one night in New York City with my boyfriend at the time, and no, the boyfriends in this story don't fare so well, but it's okay. <laughs> They're nice people, probably. So we went out with all of his friends. And when we came back to the apartment that we shared, I was all hyped up, I'd had a fun night out. And he looked at me and said, going out with you is embarrassing. Yeah, that's a bummer thing to hear. And I kind of looked at him like, what? And he said, you interrogate my friends. You ask them about their childhoods and their hopes and their dreams, like we're just at a bar. Can't you ever just do small talk? No. I don't think small talk's very fun. I like really big talk. So first I was too serious, not serious enough. I was too silly. Now I was too curious. Okay. Bummer. Now the twist during this time is that I had my dream job. I no longer had my dream relationship. That ended three days later. That's okay. But also, I wasn't a dancer anymore. In a twist, that fifth grade Allie who hid from the timed mile during the presidential physical fitness test, she never would have believed this. But grown up Allie was running for fun, by choice, <laughs> sometimes even paying money <laughs> to run. I know it doesn't make a lot of sense, but I loved it. I couldn't get enough. And when you can't shut up about something, what do you do? Yeah, you start a blog. <laughs> so that's what I did, and I called it Alley on the Run. Every morning on that downtown commute, I would write about my morning run. 10,000 words about a four-mile run around the bridal path in Central Park. Always had a flair for the dramatic writing. But running was my whole world, and it was what I loved but I was also pretty sick. And so, when my Crohn's disease, which I've lived with since I was seven, when it got to a point that I knew I needed to make a pretty major lifestyle change, I said, I think it might be time for me to leave my dream job. I need to totally overhaul this life. And so, I left the magazine, and I did it on my terms, and I was proud of the work that I had done. And so I said, okay, I'm resigning, it's all good, 
oh my God, what did I just do? I did not have a backup plan. I don't necessarily advise this. But I knew a few things. I knew I loved to run, and I knew I loved to write. And was there a way that I could marry those things? And so, back to my emails. I emailed every editor at every magazine that I read and loved and could think of. Runner's World, Women's Running, Self, Shape, Fitness, Well and Good. Everyone got emails from Allie Feller pitching them ideas. And a lot said no, and even more ignored me. But enough said yes that soon I was able to become a full-time freelance writer and editor writing about running. And I needed a hobby. <laughs> I wanted to talk more about running, and so I launched a podcast, The Alley on the Run Show. When I launched it, the goal was to have conversations with my friends about our own journeys to start and finish lines. It was just supposed to be fun. Now, it's my full-time job. It is the number one running podcast in the country. And last week, the Alley on the Run show was number 53 on Apple Podcasts' all-time sports charts. Number 53. Thank you. One of just three women-hosted shows in the top 100 in the sports category. We're going to get that number up higher. And I'm going to maybe learn more about other sports. We'll see. <laughs> the great thing about the Alley on the Run show is what I get to do, which is ask people about their childhoods and their hopes and their dreams. I get to do the curious thing, and sometimes I'm even a little bit silly. I have listened as Des Linden came on the show in 2018 and said, I want to win the Boston Marathon. And then two weeks later, she did exactly that in driving winds and rain and some of the craziest conditions we've ever seen here in Boston. I've listened as Adrienne Hazlitt came on the show and bravely talked about losing her leg in the 2013 Boston Marathon bombings and this year returned to the show to talk about completing the 2022 race in the para-athletics division that she helped create. Olympic bronze medalist Molly Seidel has been on the show, and she has shared both her best and her worst dating stories, because we do like to keep it silly sometimes. And Wyomi Atias came on the show and talked about winning Olympic gold in the 1960s at just 19 years old. Then there was Gabe Grunewald. Gabe came on the show one year before she passed away from a rare cancer as a professional athlete. And she reminded us that it's okay to struggle, but it is not okay to give up. Then, there was a point I said to my dear husband, you know, I just want to stand at finish lines and cheer for people all day. And then, light bulb, that's a job. It's called a finish line announcer. We are the people on the microphone at your start line. We tell you where to find the porta potties. <laughs> but at the finish line, we are your hype squad, we are your number one cheerleader, and we are your biggest fans. Catherine Switzer famously said, if you are losing faith in human nature, go out and watch a marathon. She was so right, and I know. I have been at the finish line of dozens of races, and I have seen firsthand the range of human emotion. Elation, joy, pride, sadness, disappointment, We've seen runners collapse, steps from the finish, and watched other runners stop their own races to help that person across the finish line by whatever means necessary. We've seen proposals. We have seen so much vomit. <laughs> there is so much of that at a finish line. But it truly is the most magical place. In 2019, I became a finish line announcer for the New York City Marathon, and being there, calling out those names until the final finisher crossed the line at 11 p.m., that experience changed my life more than running that race, which I've done three times. And this year, 2022 Boston Marathon finish line announcer, one of just a very small handful of women who have had that job. It was the greatest honor, and it changed my life. And it 
all happened because I sent the email. So I am here today to tell you to send the email. You are you, stay authentically you. Maybe you are too silly or too curious or too something for someone, but you are you and I want you to stay you. And instead of saying, I guess I'll send the email because what's the worst that might happen? Say, I'm going to send the email because this is the best thing that might happen. Send the email. Thank you.